I'm Mr. Red. Why is it so doggone important that God gave Adam and Eve a third child and named him Seth? Over a decade ago, I produced two large family history books well over 700 pages in length. Then, a man from Denver called and offered me $30,000 to create one like I did for the Smith family. The answer to why I turned it down was because the number of hours it took for me to finish this family genealogy history was far more hours than what minimum wage would have been on writing the record. Furthermore, I began a significant undertaking and did a genealogy study starting with Adam and Eve in Genesis. There has been a lot written about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and the tragic story of their first two boys. However, much less was said about their son Seth, an obscure Old Testament figure who biblical genealogies demonstrate was an ancestor to some very important people. From Seth, I expanded my genealogy study using Family Tree Maker, which I have been associated with since day one back in the 90s. But now, let's take a look at what the Bible tells us about Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel so that we can understand Seth's connection to God's first human creations. And now, for my story. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining me today on my podcast. This is your host, Sydney St. James. You know, while my study is filled with catastrophe today, the story of Cain and Abel teaches us an important lesson about living with sincerity. Through their model, we learn how our behaviors and mindsets really matter to God. It demonstrates just how devastating sin's consequences can be. And it's only through God's mercy that we learn to live with the simplicity and sincerity of God. Not just by human wisdom, but by the grace of God. After Adam and Eve were driven out of the Garden of Eden by God, they decided to begin a family. While the number of children they had is unknown, the Bible does tell us that their first two were Cain and Abel, both boys. When they grew older, Cain labored in the pastures, planting and harvesting crops, while Abel became a shepherd. As they began to reap the benefits of their new occupations, they decided to give offerings to God to show their appreciation. For his offering, Abel brought God the fattest and most desirable of his flock, which pleased God to no end. However, when Cain presented some of his harvest from the fields to God, the man upstairs wasn't pleased. Yet God understood and still gave Cain the chance to redeem himself, telling him how to remedy the situation. Now, all of this can be found in the scriptures of the Old Testament in Genesis 4, verses 6 through 7, which says, So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? 
If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at your door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Instead of making an atonement, Cain took out his resentment on his baby brother. Then, after speaking with God, Cain took Abel for a casual walk out in the fields. And it was there that Cain killed Abel. Shortly afterwards, God asked Cain where Abel had gone. And Cain tried to elude the question. But God knows all, right? So he already knew the sin he committed against his brother and punished him. So let's go back to the Bible and see just what in the world God said. What in the world have you done? Abel's blood cries out to me from under the ground. So now you're banned from the ground that opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. It shall no longer provide you its products. If you till the ground, you'll become an endless wanderer over the earth. Adam's firstborn was even more distressed after hearing what his reprimand was to be. However, he didn't express regret for his acts. He was only concerned others might want to strike him dead because of what he had done. Oh, by the way, some room for thought here. I mentioned in my previous podcast about reading through a scripture more than once to better understand it. One simple word used in this verse in the Bible speaks of others. How can that be? When Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel were the first four people in the world. No matter, just thought I'd throw it out there for something for you to think about. As I continue, in his mercy, the Lord put a tattoo on Cain so that no one would kill him on sight. Cain was then exiled to Nod, the land east of the Garden of Eden, where he later started his own family. Let's halt for a moment and check out what this story is telling us. Not just our first reflection, but multiple reflections of the scriptures. Although the Bible doesn't explicitly state how Cain messed up in presenting his sacrifice, we can draw conclusions based on what it doesn't tell us. The fact that Abel gave God the fattest sheep of his flock suggests that he gave God the very best of what he had. While the fact no distinction is made regarding Cain's sacrifice indicates that he did not offer God the best of his crop. Now, while both Cain and Abel presented some of their hard work to God, Cain was insincere in his submission. Rather than having a repentant heart and seeking to determine why God was not gratified with his offering, Cain jealously turned against Abel. Cain's failure to respond in humbleness ultimately came from his reluctance to admit his wrongdoings. Instead, Cain decided to give in to his petty jealousy and continue in a pattern of conceit and sin. The devastating results serve as a remembrance of the consequences of sin. The penalties of being too proud to admit when you're wrong and correct our ways. As a result, Cain lost his brother, was exiled from his home, and was forced to wander all over the many places of the earth for the rest of his life. After Cain killed Abel, God allowed him to start a new life in a different place and gave him a tattoo to prevent him from being noticed and killed by others. God reminds us that God 
is a God of grace. Even despite our weaknesses, our outright wickedness through these deeds of mercy, He does give us second chances. In John 1, 9, it says, If we acknowledge our sinful ways, God is faithful, and God will forgive our sins and cleanse us from every wrongdoing. Cain and Abel's story goes right alongside the story of Adam and Eve in that Cain has sinned, and Cain has made attempts to hide his sin from God. He was given another chance by God, and then ultimately, he was exiled. Both serve as a reminder of the sobering reality of humans, sinful nature, and the enduring promise of God's overwhelming grace in the face of our corruption. But back to what I was trying to accomplish over a decade ago when I set out to do a genealogy study of the Bible. At first, it wasn't difficult. Just go and find Seth in the Bible, right? Well, that's where, as Charlie Pride once said, the easy part's over now. But let's take a quick 30-second break and hear a word from my sponsor, and I'll be right back with you with the rest of my story. Have you heard about Anchor.fm by Spotify? It's the easiest way to make a podcast with everything you need all in one place. Yep, Anchor has the tools that will allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. And best of all, Anchor is totally free. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. We're back. And now, the rest of my story. Who was Seth in the Old Testament? As the third boy child of Adam and Eve, Seth was born after his brother Cain had killed Abel. When Seth came into the world, Eve said, God has granted me another wonderful child in place of Abel, indicating that having Seth filled an emptiness left after that tragedy. The Bible also talks about Adam and Eve having Seth after a section about Cain's descendants. But it's hard to say whether the author lists events chronologically or by subject. Therefore, it's possible, but just possible, that Seth was actually born a little after Abel's murder, before Cain started having his own children, or that he was born when Cain's family was well on its way. Adam was already over 130 years old when Seth was born, and lived to be just 70 years less than a thousand, while Seth lived to be 912 years of age. We need to look quickly at what happened to Seth's brothers. The story of Seth's older brothers, Cain and Abel, is perhaps one of the most well-known Bible stories. While Cain was the family's farmer, Abel was a shepherd, and they each made offerings to God. Cain's response to his condemnation was interesting. The first thing the Bible mentions after he was cursed to wander the earth is that he had a son he called Enoch, and Cain named a city after his son. Since a city now is usually a collection of a bunch of buildings of some kind or another in one place, It appeared that Cain was fighting this curse to wander. He was tired of moving from place to place. More generations quickly followed, including some descendants who became known for creating new tools and, in some cases, 
new and different sinful behaviors went right along with it. Lamech, Cain's great-great-great-grandson, is the first polygamist discussed ever in the Bible. Okay, I'm still filling in more blanks in my genealogy studies, and let me tell you, it is difficult, more difficult than putting a family history together of 700 pages. So, as I produce this podcast, that brings me now to Lamech's three sons. One was named Jabel, or you could pronounce it Jabal. He was the head of the family of those who lived in tents and raised livestock. Jubal was the head of the family of those who played stringed instruments, like guitars, violins, fiddles, and, and also flutes. Tubal Cain forged all sorts of tools made out of bronze and made out of iron. While the Bible doesn't say a word about Abel having a wife or children, this doesn't necessarily mean that he didn't fool around and have numerous children that we don't know about. Unfortunately, biblical genealogies are sometimes selective, making it very difficult to just plug and play in my family tree maker. Let me give you an example. The listing of King David's wives in 1 Chronicles only mentions the wives who had boys. Not every woman David ever married or fathered children are mentioned in the Bible. Likewise, the genealogical line of Adam listed in Genesis 5 centers itself around Seth, leaving Cain out of it and Abel out of it altogether, even though we realize Cain did have children. So the reality that the Bible doesn't mention anything about Abel having children may not mean he died without having any children. It's just I couldn't find any in the Bible. It's also interesting that when God cursed Cain to wander, Cain replies that some stranger may kill him if he strays. This indicates that Cain, Abel, and their parents were not the only ones on the planet in history. You can't worry about being slain by a complete stranger if the only humans in existence are your parents and maybe a few sisters too. Another point can be made about how Lamech murdered a man whose name he never mentions, suggesting that he didn't even know his victim. The Old Testament says various men lived long lives and fathered children, even in their old age. Abraham and Ishmael are just a couple to name a few. So let me ask you this. If Cain's family didn't come along with him when he meandered, if he was a careless father going everywhere and fathering more children here and there, it's possible that by Lamech's time, the Cain family wasn't keeping track of one another. However, this does appear unlikely. Even in a large family with many generations, it's hard to meet someone you don't know when your immediate family is, in fact, the only family around. Scholars have suggested several ways to explain these references to other people, including arguing for the existence of angels who had human children, citing, as I mentioned in my last podcast, the sons of God, which are mentioned in Genesis 6, 4, and spoken more about, of course, in episode 24. Another possibility is that Abel and Cain had several children and even grandchildren when Abel's murder took place. Unfortunately, nothing was found in my genealogy studies, so this is all speculation since the Bible doesn't give any details on this subject far as I could find. Now, if you don't mind, Let's head back to Genesis 5. I don't want to make it too confusing, even though doing a family history is confusing sometimes. And let's check on Seth. And how did he end up in all of this family history? 
According to Genesis 5, Seth turned out possibly well. He had a son, and he named that son Enosh, and a descendant he named Enoch several generations later. Enoch is described as living 365 years, and Enoch walked faithfully and believed in God. Then he was no more because God took him away. All of a sudden, he just disappears out of the Bible. This appears to be saying that Enoch didn't physically die like the prophet Elijah. Instead, God simply took him straight up to heaven. Now, Enoch's son, Methuselah, lived 969 years, making him the oldest man mentioned in the Bible. Now, back to Genesis 5. It establishes through the scriptures that Noah was Methuselah's grandson, which makes him a direct descendant of Seth. Seth's ancestry is also mentioned in Chronicles, which starts by saying Seth and a bunch of ancestors leading to Noah, then describes the family branches created by Noah's three sons. My genealogy studies picked up the pace here, but get a load of this. Since Noah's family was the only one who survived the flood, Seth's direct family line survived God's wrath, whereas Cain's family line didn't. Given that the Bible mentioned Cain's family having some dysfunction, Cain murdering his brother Abel, Lamesh being a polygamist, and killing a total stranger, this may very well suggest Seth's family followed God much more closely. Thus, my genealogy studies stop here for Cain and continue on with Seth. Now, I need to ask you, are there possibly any lessons we can learn from this story so far? Since the Bible tells us very little about Seth's personal life, we don't know how he got along with Adam and Eve or any brothers and sisters that we are not aware of. Likewise, we don't know anything about his relationship with Cain, just how much he really knew about his brother Abel, or how he reacted when he learned about his brother's death. However, the Bible does say that Seth was a son just like his father Adam, suggesting Seth was the praiseworthy heir to Adam's legacy. Furthermore, the fact that it was his descendants, not Cain's, who held on to God's teaching and endured the flood suggests he followed God and set up a spiritual legacy for his family to follow. In light of this, the most important lesson we can learn from Seth is the value of following in our parents' teachings about God and passing that knowledge on to our very own children. The narrative of the story of Seth also shows us something about the value of paying close attention to the mistakes our parents or siblings make. Adam made a critical mistake by eating the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden, which had enormous consequences for his family. Cain sinned in his own way by murdering his brother and then there are no mentions of any record of Seth committing any terrible sins, which does suggest he knew when he shouldn't follow his family's example and when he should follow it. On a more familiar level, the very fact that Seth was born in the first place is definitely an example of how the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Losing Abel was a terrible experience for Adam and Eve, a loss that couldn't truly ever be replaced. However, the birth of Seth brought Eve great joy, and the fact he followed Adam's example would have made them both very, very proud. Tragedy will most definitely take place in this life, but 
There are moments of joy as well that alleviate the hurt. Well, this ends today's episode as the last for season two. Be sure to go up at the top or somewhere on the podcast homepage and click a little rectangular button that has follow in it to be sent a quick notification of all the episodes that will be coming out in season three. Coming up next week, we'll kick off a special podcast to kick off our season three. Now, I say a special, that's because I've talked about my 50 novels, or 50 plus novels rather, throughout the first two seasons and would like to give a broad range of tips from start to finish for anyone wanting to write a book or get published. So be sure to join me if you or a friend you know has been wanting to write a book or wanting to get a book published and I'm sure this will be a very interesting opener for season three. Until next time, as always, thank you so much for dropping in and listening to my podcast. Until later, see you later, alligator. Well, that does it for another episode on the Sydney St. James Show. I want to thank everyone for listening and everyone for dropping by today. Also, I'd like to ask you, if you haven't already done so, be sure to click the follow button. Leave a short review with maybe, hmm, kind words. And tell your friends about the Sydney St. James Show. And share the, share the show with anyone that you think might like the show. The more, the merrier. And maybe by the end of this year, our goal is to have 100,000 listeners for the Sydney St. James Show, and I want you part of that listening group. Until the next great episode from the Sydney St. James Show, again, thank you very much from me, Sydney St. James. <laughs>